Amen for sure. Hey guys, uh, turn to the person next to you and say, I see you. I see you. Like I saw that you actually got up this morning and bundled up and went outside for an outdoor service. I see that you should have worn more clothes when you went to the outdoor service. I see that you should have brought something hot to drink to the outdoor service. Or you're sitting at home, turn to the person next to you and go, hey, I see you there in your pajamas. I see you watching from your comfy chair. Like It doesn't really matter, right? Because no matter where we are, we think we can be hidden, but there's always somebody who can see us. And I think that sometimes we lose sight of that. We have a guest come over and we begin to tidy things up because we know that they're going to see us. They're going to see our living room. They're going to see our dining room. And we want that to look all right. We're getting ready to go out for a night on the town and we know that people are going to see us and we want to look all right, at least for the most part, right? And the early church, as we're talking about here in Revelation, uh, we see a church that was hurting. We see a church that was enduring a lot of intense persecution. Many of them uh, were hiding from, from all of the, the things that could go wrong. Like the church in many ways had been driven underground. Because if they continued to worship outright, then there was oppression from the Roman authorities. They could lose their life. They could lose their job. They could lose their family members. There was so much that they were facing in the midst of all of this. And we saw in Revelation chapter 1 uh, last week that John, one of the apostles of Jesus, is the guy writing this letter. And as he's writing the letter, he is addressing a church that is looking for any sign of hope. Like Jesus has left us. Jesus said he was coming back. But when? How long do we have to endure all of this stuff that we're enduring? Why do we have to put up with the Roman authorities? Why do we have to, to hide in, in the corner to worship God if we don't want to avoid or if we want to avoid persecution? And John's like, I get it. Right at this time, he's an elderly man. He's been beaten. He's been imprisoned. And right now he is on the island of Patmos, which is basically like Alcatraz. He's... He's 30 some miles away from the coast, all because he was sharing the word of God. And an angel of God spoke to him and said, hey, write this stuff down that you're about to see. And so we're diving into what we know is an apocalyptic reading of God's word, which is basically taking real life today stuff and interpret it in the light of the spiritual world God has created us in and in the future that has not yet happened all with the hopes of trying to influence our behavior. And so we see a picture of Jesus in chapter 1 that is definitely not a poor carpenter's son. It's definitely not the miracle man that we've been accustomed to seeing throughout the Gospels, where the crowds were gathered and people just couldn't wait to see this guy who healed people and, and who challenged the religious authority on some of the, the stands that they took. But in Revelation chapter 1, we see a Jesus who comes in with power and with authority. And one of the things that, that describes him is he's got the, the seven stars in his hand. These are the angels of the seven churches. He's got power in his hand. He's got these feet of bronze. He's able to, to have great stability and extend punishment to other people. Uh, a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Eyes that are like... A blazing fire that just pierces to the center of your being so that when you step into the into the room with Jesus, we can almost hear Jesus say, I see you. Now, depending on how we're living, and some of you know, like mom and dad walk in and they see you and you're struggling with stuff and they're like, hey, I see you. I want to help. You're like, OK, great. They, they see me. And other times. You're doing something you know you shouldn't be doing. And mom and dad step in and go, I see you. Right? So what does Jesus see when he sees us? What does Jesus see when he sees the church in Redwood or in, in Columbus, Nebraska, in, in, in the world today? Does he see a church that's on fire? Does he see a church that is ready to, to light things up, a church that is anchored in his hope, a church that wants to be 
uh, uh, actively involved in what he's doing. And so we see that this book, Revelation, is written to the seven churches. And in chapters 2 and 3, we get to see those seven churches. Now, the seven churches are in what would be modern-day Turkey. Uh, in here, it's referred to as an Asia Minor. If you want to dig in deeper to these, I would encourage you to go back in our sermon archive and look for a series called Seven, where we unpack each one of these in a different message. But at least for now, as we dive in, I want, to sh I want you to see the pattern of behavior, and I want you to know that there is a Jesus who sees. And so let's just read together Revelation chapter 2, and I want you to see uh, in that first church, Ephesus, the pattern that's being laid out. First, he starts with a piece of the description that was already given in chapter 1. Every one of the seven churches has some piece that was given in that description in chapter 1. So to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. The lampstands are the churches. Right? Jesus is among us. He doesn't just see us. He is among us and he has power and authority in his right hand. And that same Jesus says to the church that is gathered together in Ephesus, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. I want you to hear those words today. Not as Ephesus, but as the church. That Jesus could step in and he could say, hey guys, I know, I know that you are a young church and you're doing great things. I know that you are out in the community and you're loving on people and you're giving stuff away and you're trying to help those who are in need. Church, I know that, that up to now you have been portable and without your own space. I, I know what you're looking forward to. Right? I, I know the work of, of the particular ministry that you're involved in. And every step of the way, he can say, I know. Right? I, I know that you're in your workplace and the boss just caught you being lazy for a minute and you're like, dude, did you even see all the stuff I was doing while everybody else was on break? Did you even see? Did you, did you know that I was up late last night working till midnight and that's why maybe I'm struggling a little bit this next day? And maybe you've got that teacher uh, that's, that's got high expectations of you and you're like if you even knew what I was dealing with at home if you even knew the stress and the struggles that I'm trying to endure on the home front then you wouldn't be maybe so critical of what it is that I'm trying to accomplish and I think we all probably want to know that there's somebody out there that knows and I want you to see that description of Jesus again right I am here Right? I have power in my hand, and I'm present walking among you. And I know, right? That's another way of saying I see. I know what you're up to, right? I, I know the struggles in your marriage. I know that whenever you go to church, you act this way, but at home, it's not as pleasant that you're working through some stuff. I know what it's like that you're trying to find that significant other or that you're trying to conceive. I know that you're having struggles with your child, or your adult child, or maybe your parent. I, I know. I know that you're struggling to hold down a job. I know that you're struggling to make ends meet financially. I know. Can you just receive that, that word for a moment in yourself? That you serve a Jesus that knows you. Ready? He's not just gone, but he's present in your life. Now, unfortunately, sometimes when we know that kind of Jesus, it can also leave us wondering and searching for hope. I, I know that he knows, but if he knows what I'm going through, why isn't he providing relief? Jesus, where are you? Jesus, do you even care about what I'm going through? Is there any hope at all? Is there any healing? 
Is there any relief? But not only does Jesus know us in the good stuff, he knows the progress you've been making. Right? Some of you are brand new to Christianity. You're brand new to opening up your Bible. And Jesus knows right where you are. And he's so excited for that journey. But there's others of us. And Jesus knows, like, yeah, you say you, say you believe, but you're not really in it. You say you believe, but there's a disconnect. And this is what he says to the church in Ephesus. But I have this against you. Jesus is presenting a little bit of the I know buts. I know what you're dealing with. I know what you're going through. But let's be real. You also have some other stuff you need to work on. And he sees that too. And he tells the church in Ephesus, you have abandoned the love you had at first. Oh, you came out of the gate swinging. You are on fire. Nothing was going to stop you. And you've began to back down from the fire that you had inside. You began to get a little complacent with your faith. You began to get busy and allow other things and activities consume you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Repent is to stop doing what we know is wrong and to turn and start doing what's right. And this is exactly what we're talking about with the apocalyptic style of reading. It's confronting our current reality with a spiritual world and a promise to the future, all in hopes of changing the current reality. You have forsaken your love. Let's get back on track, guys. And yet this I have, this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And this last piece, to the one who conquers. This whole series is called to the one who conquers. Every one of these churches has this same recipe. We, we have a, a description of Jesus so we can picture him in his awe, his power, and his authority. We can know that he is present in our life. We can know that he sees us in our current reality, in our current struggles, in all the stuff that's going on. Jesus knows, but we also know that if he sees us in the good times, he sees the struggles. He sees the ways that we don't quite measure up. He sees the way that we get complacent or arrogant, full of ourselves or we're not chasing after him at all. Instead, we're chasing after the things that this world would have to offer. Instead of bowing uh, before the feet of Jesus, we bow to current culture and the realities around us. We may not completely give up on Jesus, but we've begun to give up on living for Jesus. And he says to the one who conquers, to the one who holds on, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. That's a promise of heaven, guys. And each one of these, each one of these passages says kind of the same thing. Now, each church is dealing with a different thing. Each church has different joys, frustrations, and challenges. Each one is given a different description of who Jesus is. And each one is given a different to the one who overcomes kind of a promise. But the promise is the same. It's kind of a progressive parallelism that we see in Revelation, a different literary technique that I tell you once so that you'll hear it. And I'll tell you it again, but a little bit different way so you'll understand it a little bit more. And then I'll tell it to you again so that it sinks in a little bit deeper. And so as he's moving from church to church, seven churches, seven lampstands, seven spirits, we're talking about perfection here. We're talking about holiness we're, we're talking about the work of God and everything is striving to get us to a place of perfection and completeness. And so all of this is working together. But what I want us to be challenged with here today, guys, is if there was a letter in here and the letter simply said to the angel of the church in Columbus. I know, I know, I know what you've done. I know what you've continued to do. 
I, I know that nine years ago, as you were making your way into this community, that there was nobody that knew that you existed. I know that that out of out of nothing, this was created. I know all of the setup and all of the teardown. I know all of the trailers and all of the tech issues. I know all of the, the deals with weather and not weather and inflatables and staffing and volunteerism and tired mornings and cold mornings. And I know it. I'm Jesus. I know it. I know all the people who have stepped into the waters of baptism because there's a church shining its light in Columbus, Nebraska. I know that there are kids in our kids ministry that are growing because of a church in Columbus, Nebraska. I know that there are kids who without this church would be far from me, but because of your faithful work, they're doing great things. I know that there are marriages that would be broken without a church in Columbus, Nebraska. I know. Right, And I know that in your current reality, you're struggling with something. You're struggling with an addiction. You're struggling with a sin issue. You're struggling to get your feet back underneath of you. You're struggling to reclaim the love you had at first. I know. I know. I also see that you need to pick it up a little bit. Not because I'm judging you, but because I love you. Because I want what's best for you. I want to see you do way more than you ever thought possible. And I know that you can. Right? I know that you're holding back. I know that you're not giving it your all. And you can. You can stand up against all that this world has to, to have in opposition. And to the one who conquers connection. To the one who conquers, to the one who holds on, there is a crown of life, right? There is a kingdom prepared for you in paradise. To the one who conquers, Jesus is writing that letter. Now, if Jesus was writing a letter to me, a letter to the angel of the household of Mike, Is there some things that I would want to know that Jesus sees going on in my life? Right? Some of you are walking that journey with us. You know, we're, we're starting a Hispanic church and we're trying to get things prepared for this facility. And, and life goes on and kids are in college and, and you know, marriage is, is still a thing. And so you're trying to take time personally and time for your family. And, and I see the work. I see the diligence. I see... The, the, the 10 years of commitment at Connection Christian Church. I've seen the works of the ministry. I, I know that your heart is good and that you're trying to do things, but I've got some things you need to work on. Are you pastoring at home the way that you're pastoring with people in the community? Are you taking the time to invest in the things that maybe you're going to hit a little bit closer that nobody else can do? that I've uniquely wired you to do. I, I know that you need to invest in your leaders more and let them know that you love them, that you care about them. I know your struggles. I know your temptations. I know your moments of weakness. So I'm going to leave you with this. What letter is Jesus writing to you? Where is it you need to know in your life that, hey, Jesus, he sees me? Where is it in your life that you need to hear the yeah, but, that you need to be called into accountability and that you need to go, yeah, I'm not quite there yet. It's the one who conquers to the one who overcomes. Guys, let's look forward to the crown of life together. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to just dig into your word. 
to see the pattern that you've laid out with John to the seven churches and to just help us to receive that and to personalize it for our church family, but individually. That we know that you are God, the God who has all power, who is all seeing, who is all knowing, who wants better for us because it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. Father, help us to strive to be more like Jesus and to enter into that kingdom together. And as long as we're here on this earth, to shine your light, to be your lampstands that others can come to know you more fully. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.